sure did not want to waste a bunch of my time and a bunch of other people's money on a program that could not succeed. That was my goal, right? I did not want to be the guy who got tapped on the head or patted on the head and said, thank you for joining the race. You've elevated the debate. The race is better with you in it. Yeah, I'm willing to do it if I was going to win. And so I spent a fair bit of time to try to develop a strategy to say, okay, how does a relatively unknown, wonkish, funny-looking university professor actually win in this crowded field. And remember, I was running against not only the guy who'd been running for the job for many years, um, I was running against four members of city council, an existing MLA, a former MLA and member of city council, a well-respected corporate executive, and the anchor of the six o'clock news. <laughs> um, this was challenging. And so what we did is we really crafted a strategy based on three things, one of which was outside of our control. The first one, I guess it wasn't really outside of our control because I'd worked on it for so long, was that Calgary was ready. Those of you who know the political culture in Alberta know that we don't tend to change very often. And, um, and in many ways, when I got back to Calgary in 2001, it was a very sclerotic um, culture. Like there was a convention, you couldn't challenge the conventional wisdom. The place wasn't having conversations about the future. And over the course of the next few years, I certainly worked at it, but it wasn't me. It was the whole community. There was a real shift, like a cracking of the ice, where suddenly it was okay to oppose, and it was okay to have different kinds of discussions. You know, we have not one, not two, not three, but four different TEDx organizations to do these lectures, every one of them sells out. You have to write an essay as to why you should be able to go watch. Um, you know, uh, we have these pachaka cha nights, do you know what that is? Where you show these slides, eight seconds each or 20 seconds each, something like that, that regularly fill the concert halls, right? People were really ready for that conversation and we could feel that shift, that zeitgeist change in how people were thinking about their community, so that was one. Number two is something that I stole from Don Iveson, the mayor of Edmonton, before he was the mayor. And that was what I call politics in full sentences. As you can tell, I am no good at speaking in sound bites. Uh, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for people's ability to engage on complex issues. Uh, that understanding that there are shades of gray, not just black and white, in the kinds of work that we do. And so I decided that I would just talk to people. There was a point where I kicked off my campaign. I made a campaign speech at a place called Art Central in Calgary. And this guy showed up. I didn't recognize him. And he had a consumer grade video camera, as well as two or three, this is before iPhones could do video. I know that's only three years ago, it's shocking. But he had two or three of these kind of $50, they used to be called flip cams, with some clamps, C clamps that he got from the hardware store. And he walked up to a volunteer and he said, can I film the candidate's speech? And the volunteer said, I guess. So he put these little flip cams on the railings around where I was speaking so he got different angles. And he took a little consumer grade camcorder and followed my speech around. He edited this thing overnight and put it up on his YouTube channel. Turns out he had filmed me giving a TEDx lecture some months earlier and he thought it was interesting. So he thought, well, let's try to film him again. And also the TEDx lecture, if you've ever seen it, where I talk about uh, communities splitting apart, has the single worst camera angle imaginable, and I think he felt guilty. <laughs> and, uh, so he filmed my whole speech, 14 minutes long, and he put it up on his YouTube channel. And within a week, he had hundreds and thousands of hits. And because he had access to the analytics, we knew that people were watching the whole darn thing beginning to end. And so I look back at Don Iveson, who had ran for council three years ago with the ugliest brochures you've ever seen in your life. 10 point font, just unbelievable walls of text. Um, and I said, well, we're gonna try that. Mine were much prettier than his, I have to say. But um, we just engaged with people in that way, open bracket. After I got elected, I talked about politics in full sentences a lot, and I felt guilty, because I had stolen it from Don. And so I kept trying to attribute it to him that uh, this is what the city councilor in Edmonton did. And then finally, he does an interview, and he's like, well, he's a bit raw. First, it's not politics in full sentences, it's politics in complete sentences. 
And I said, oh, I have a great marketing crop because I approved on that. And then he said, and by the way, I stole it from the West Wing. <laughs> but that was number two, don't treat people like idiots. And I continue to do that in my current job. Drive the media crazy because they're always looking for white hats and black hats, good and evil, simple narratives. And sometimes there's a lot of gray. You know, they can't figure out if I'm pro or anti bikes because I'm trying to put cycle tracks where people actually use them. <laughs> and, uh, but people, I think, appreciate it. You know, when we have very complex decisions, I actually say, look, this was a complex decision. Here's what I weighed. This is why I made the decision I made. We try to involve people in those conversations to this day. Um, and I think that that's working. So that was the second thing. The third thing was an old, old political adage. Go to people where they live. Don't expect them to come to you. And so when I launched my campaign uh, on Victoria Day and Long Weekend in 2010, I had the summer ahead of me. I didn't have any money. And so one of the things I had to do was just be out there as much as I possibly could. So anywhere where people gathered, anywhere where people were living in community, breathing the air, the same air as their neighbors, as I always say, I was there. The people in purple t-shirts, um, festivals, river pathways in the summer, parks, um, ethnic community things, churches, temples. We were just wherever people would gather, we were there, talking about community, talking about their hopes and dreams for the future of the city. The other thing we learned is that a lot of people live online in an online community. And so we just decided, well, let's just join those communities in an authentic way and talk to people. And one thing that we discovered was that the conventional wisdom in municipal elections, which are always in October, is that the race really starts on Labor Day because nobody is possibly paying attention to politics during the summer. And one of the things we learned is that's by and large true. But the people who are paying attention are the hyper-engaged. And the hyper-engaged are a very, very powerful tool. Conventional wisdom tells you that for every name in your voter database, that's worth two to three votes. They'll tell their spouse, they'll tell their kids um, that they should vote for you. We anticipate that our hyper-engaged evangelists who we found online and who we started campaigning for us online, they're the kind of people, and everyone who studies political science is this kind of person, whose friends will say, ah, who should I vote for? And so we anticipate that every hyper-engaged voter is actually worth two to 300 votes. Uh, and so getting out to those people first and having them do the work of your campaign is incredibly important um, in building that wave and building that trend and finally, I'll just tell you about the sidewalk job, which has nothing to do with me. So my team sends out an email the day before the election, Sunday, the election's on Monday. They send out an email Sunday at 9 a.m. saying, everyone who can, please meet in the campaign office at 10 o'clock tonight, 10 p.m. the night before the election. And they wouldn't tell me what it was about. And they're just like, you have to show up too. And so I showed up, and this young volunteer who I'd never met before, said, I had an idea, and the campaign manager thought it was a good idea. So I went to Toys R Us, and I bought up their entire stock of sidewalk chalk. And so we sent this group of three or 400 people who showed up at 10 o'clock the night before the election um, to throughout the city. And they went to apartment buildings in the downtown, and they pasted posters facing indoors, on the outside of the doors, saying where and when to vote. Um, and they sidewalk chalked LRT stations, major pedestrian routes, sidewalks throughout the whole city, reminding people to vote. Our voter turnout in that election was higher than it had been in 40 years. And I bet that simple little tool of using the sidewalk chalk, which everyone has stolen now, um, <laughs> was a really huge part of that because people went, a regular human being like me took the time to do this. The least I could do is take the time to vote. By the way, don't use spray chalk. I don't <laughs> really mad. <laughs> we probably have time for a couple more. Yes. 